Is there something here to be said around the need to be real active listeners? Is there something here to be said around positioning yourself as just silent listening, taking in information from people who perhaps are reluctant to put both feet in because of fear or don't want to be active participants in change because of fear? I think fear really is the kind of... um, it's a starting point for a lot of people who don't want to engage in change. There is something there. In order for you to figure out what that catalyst is around the fear, you have to be able to actively listen, even if that member of your team isn't directly speaking to you, or even if that member of the team isn't speaking, you're listening in lots of different ways. And by that, I mean, you've got to kind of take this in an abstract form. You know, what is happening in different scenarios and different spaces and places within the 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 school within the learning environment how is that person responding what is it that you're picking up by being kind of leaders who are tuned in empathetic who really get to know people you start being able to see those signs and those cues and that active listening is a part of that so what are you picking up from that person and how are you really observing the way in which that person's interacting and engaging And then you're looking for things that excite that particular person. What makes that person comes alive? Because we've all got something that makes us come alive. And it might be really difficult for you to find that if you're only looking for one way in which people demonstrate excitement. And this is what I mean about having multiple lenses. That excitement or that feeling of fire in terms of like a positive feeling of fire is different for different people. So I am a really expressive communicator I like humor I often use my hands um I like being really loud I like being really brash but I'm not like that all of the time I recognize and see what style of communication and active listening works depending on what environment I'm in because I'm always looking at social cues from people but I also recognize as well that that active listening it requires you to be really um patient And as a leader, I think that patience is essential if you're really going to get people, everybody involved. So they were just the things that kind of came to mind as you were kind of reading that that question. Becky, um, Jennifer, is there anything that you... Yeah, that's it. The active listening and listening beyond what somebody might be saying to you, like you're listening around it, you're listening for what's under it. Um, I... This idea of, you know, everybody's going to, um, th- there are a lot of reasons that people don't want to experiment. They don't want to, um, they don't want to learn. They've got other things going on and they would do it at a different time in their life or in a different moment, different content. Um, and from the work I've done around um, rolling out initiatives and common reasons why people don't, you know, kind of want to move forward is that they're, they're afraid exactly what you mentioned. They, they're afraid they don't know enough and they won't, they're afraid that they don't know how to do it. Uh, They're afraid they, they, they need a little bit more of that purpose. um, And that explanation, they, they, they don't, they, they're worried that the workload will be too much and it will unbalance their seesaw. They're, um, they don't feel that they'll have support. Uh, they're worried about what will happen if they do experiment and it goes wrong. There are very common things that you could maybe uh, anticipate that could be possible things that people in general are concerned about, validly concerned about, and possibly preempt by saying, you know, it's it's happened to me that I fear, or people have often said, and so here are just some, here are some answers if anybody is having these kinds of worries or these kinds of concerns. Um, and that I think helps people see that their individual anxiety or whatever isn't unusual um and it's okay to be less open because of these things this is very common that doesn't make it doesn't make it that people aren't going to do 
or shouldn't be moving forward, but it's that these are very common things. And so to not be angry at people who are, not be frustrated with people who are uh, less open to experimenting, right? Um, So just be ready with that. But there's also this idea of being a model and creating a psychological safe space to experiment. Like, do you bomb? Do you mess up? Is it is it already there in the team that this is this is okay for us to do that? Um, and if we do that, how will we how will we be welcomed in our in our humanity and in our mess up? Um, it might not be from that person's upbringing, like you know. Um, it might not be from things that they've that they've experienced before that it's acceptable to to experiment. That is just they have to be perfect. And I think that teachers of record uh, and the adult that we're supposed to be, um, we have in our field really put us up to we are the person who's in charge. And now all of a sudden, in you know, now all of a sudden you want me to stretch and experiment and wait a minute. I thought I was in, I thought I was fully cooked and I'm the person that gives the grade and I'm the person to wait a minute. So it's a very different feeling. And all of a sudden to say, no, it's actually, you get a high mark by experimenting, not doing it right. That actually gives you a high mark in an A people. Whoa, that is not how I was raised in my, that's not what the tests showed, you know? So it's a, it's a shift in the culture of the schools, but it's also an understanding that where might you anticipate where people would be concerned and to uh, preempt that with some possible supports. That's what I would say. Thank you both. Both fantastic answers and such a great question. Um, Yeah, again, full of full of nuance. What really occurred to me as you were both sharing your answers was that what we do in the classroom is the same as what we do within a team or an organization. It's like one reflects the other. Um, and, and this kind of idea, just thinking back to Kath Murdoch's work, um, who again, we've been working with recently, so she's fresh in my mind, but she talks about kind of transporting learning. So if you're talking about in terms of um, developing a learning skill like perseverance. Here's you persevering at this, let's say your football practice, and let's take that and we can move it over here and you can persevere in this area too. You can use the same skills, but it's not necessarily obvious until you've made it explicit. So that kind of everything you're describing, I'm thinking, well, that's what I'd do with the students in my class, you know? So that kind of involvement and that, it, what really struck me was everybody wants to be seen, heard and valued. You know, no matter what age we are, where where we are, we want to feel seen, heard and valued. And that's what makes us feel safe to then take risks. You know, so um, that idea that we can we can share like I would share. So I'm thinking about kind of classes and early training I, ha- I had when I think about a class, if I saw children who were struggling to engage or would feel on the fringes a little bit. I would spend time really studying those children and doing exactly what you described, Liz, thinking, what are they motivated by? What, you know, when when they're happy, what are they doing? When they're really engaged, what have we put in place to enable that? Um, you know, what are their struggles? Why might it be that they're, you know, that they're not engaging here? And then I would plan my learning around what motivated that child. And it would inevitably impact on the rest of the class. It was one of the most useful strategies I learned to um, to create inclusion, because if you looked at those kind of five or six children who weren't engaging as much, you inevitably improved your practice, included them and included everybody around them. So I'm just thinking that's exactly the strategy you can use with staff, which staff are finding it most difficult to engage develop their practice and what's going on for them and how can we support that um and i loved your piece jennifer as well about um the psychologically safe uh, making it psychologically safe to make mistakes and does your system match that but that's so important for for leadership leadership like leadership you know to to have that system that reflects it because we don't necessarily for sure in the uk have a system that encourages that and it's down to leadership to create the environment where that's okay. 